So the Arnett analysis is just a cephalometric analysis, which is an analysis of the, the lateral profile x-ray. And cephalometric analyses have existed for a very long time. You have prominent names like the, the Steiner analysis, uh, Ricketts analysis, uh, Coggs, um, Sassuni, um, all these greats in orthodontics and uh, have you know, developed these different analyses to help figure out what the face is doing. Um, Dr. Arnett uh, published his analysis um, over the course of uh, two publications. Uh, he called it facial keys, and um, and it gets taught. It gets taught in orthodontic programs and orthodontic surgery programs alike. So it's just one of those you know analyses that gets studied in in school. I think that the difference is is up until his analysis, and then also. Dr. Larry Andrews, his analysis, that people were not analyzing the face uh, independently. It was always a question of where the bones and the teeth are. And so that, that makes the difference. And then to answer your question about Bill, uh, Bill retired about, I don't know, maybe six years ago from uh, jaw surgery, but he's not retired in the sense that um, he still lectures. In fact, he just gave a lecture to the University of Washington uh, oral surgeons and orthodontists. So he lectures a lot. He helps uh, design software for the analysis and treatment planning of uh, patients. And so he's a busy guy. He's just not operating anymore. Mm -hmm. What would be, um, practically speaking, as the rubber meets the road, how is it different to plan a jaw surgery around the face in and of itself, as opposed to building it around the teeth and as you keep saying, the bones? Yeah. Um, so there's, I would say there's two aspects to that question. One is uh, we'll talk about maybe the, uh, the difference between the face and the, the base bones. But then I think we need to talk a little bit about what what the word normal means and when we talk about um normocentric uh analyses so the difference is is that um uh, initially what all these cephalometric analyses had done is they took people who were considered class one so that their bites were fitting together you know really nicely and they took you know, X amount of subjects who were considered to be class one. And then they measured the position of the parts uh, in their teeth and their bones to get uh, a distribution. You know, they want to find out the highest distribution of the position of any part that they might be measuring, right? So they come up with this bell curve and what lies in the middle is what they call uh, normal. So, for example, in the Steiner analysis, they would look at where the position of the upper jaw is relative to um, a point here in the middle of the skull, the, the nose, and then down here to where the bone is. And so the question for Steiner was, hey, where is this bone point right here relative to this cranial uh, reference point? for this group of patients. And, uh, you know, that's a great analysis. It's uh, epidemiologic. It's trying to find out, you know, what the repeating position is for, for that location. It served us well for a time, but that doesn't really have any kind of relationship to the face itself because that's, that's a hard tissue point. And uh, so after that came my orthodontist, the guy that did my braces, was uh, Robert Ricketts. And um, Dr. Ricketts uh, added a lot of facial points, so like soft tissue uh, analysis. He came up with, uh, I guess maybe his most famous would be the E-line from the nose to the chin. And uh, 
And so he was interested in the face and how the face looked based on the bones, but his analysis still relied on a lot of structures up here in the cranium, and those are reference points. Um, another example might be, there's a, there's a reference plane that a lot of surgeons use even to this day called Frankfurt Horizontal. And it's, it's from, you know, the tragus to the eye. And that was a reference plane that was established for epidemiological purposes, for the, for the purposes of studying populations. There was no, there's no inherent uh, meaning to the Frankfurt horizontal line. It just, it's tragus to the eye. So the canthus and it's like, or to the inferior orbital rim. And it's, uh, it, it has no inherent meaning by itself and definitely no relationship to the face. But through the years, Frankfurt Horizontal, and even up to today, is used as a reference point to build faces. So it's like, why? Why, why are we using that? So what ends up happening is Dr. Arnett then decides, well, why are we picking origins of measurements? Like, why are we looking at the face, but then comparing it to sites that are up here in our cranium? And what he did is he started from the point okay, where's the center of the face? And he deemed the center of the face here underneath the nose at a point called subnasality. And, um, and so all of his measurements come from a plane, a point and a plane that travels through subnasality. Um, and he measures where the lips are. He measures where the cheeks are, where the chin is, and the soft tissue, uh, nose, chin, lips as well as the bones, but all of those measurements are made to a plane that exists out here in front of the face instead of up here in the cranium. Mm -hmm. And so that, that becomes a meaningful reference, right? So that's a meaningful reference point as opposed to the cranium, which was, which are reference points that were chosen for ease of repeatability, right? right. So if I told you, hey, find Fro Frankfurt horizontal, okay, Orion orbitali. That's easy to find in every cephalometric tracing that you have. But again, you know, it doesn't have any meaning for the face. So what does that mean? That means that, okay, you take one jaw surgeon who's going to use these uh, older cephalometric analysis analyses to find out where to put the face. And um, they're going to be right. Uh, a fair percentage of the time based on the studies of what is considered normal, but they're not going to be right all the time because the patient who's sitting in front of you doesn't necessarily belong to the group of patients that were studied back in the day when those analyses were studied. They might lie, you know, so for normative analyses and statistics, you have a, uh, you know, a, a curve and if you live underneath the curve, you're considered normal, like in the middle. But you could have a patient whose basic facial form is out here on the edges. And if you treat to the middle, you're going to miss that patient, right? Right. So what, what his analysis did, because he's studying 100 beautiful people, not 100 correct, you know, tooth position people, he is building in bias towards, quote, beauty. Of course, it's in his eyes, granted, but it removes a little bit of the bias. So the reason his analysis works better is because, one, he injected the bias of beauty, and two, um, it's the face that he's analyzing. So, but even with Dr. Annette, you know, the patient who's in front of you is not necessarily he doesn't, that patient, he or she doesn't really always fit that mold. And so the question is, Steiner tells us where to put the upper incisor in the face. Arnett tells us where to put the upper incisor in the face. But when that patient shows up into your office, where does it really belong for facial function? Right. And, and that would be the addition to the Arnett analysis where I try to get a more functional face. So I take things into consideration that have to do with speech and chewing and swallow and breathing and, uh, 
and we've analyzed those aspects and where is the best place for the structures of the face for those things to occur. So you have normal, and that's a word I really, it's not a good word for treating patients. Nobody, nobody needs to be treated to a normal. Normals help us understand growth and development. But for example, I think you've had, I think you've talked to Dr. Evans before, right? I have a couple of times. So, um, so Mariana says and, and teaches that the modern face is a smaller face, right? It's a, it's a face that, uh, because of whatever reason, is uh, not as projected as it used to be. Well, if that's the case, and then you gather 100 or 200 people and you do a cephalometric analysis and you take a normal of the population, now your normal is a small face, right? Right. So then what are you doing? You're Well, every patient you're treating, you're treating shy of their best, yeah. whatever is best for that individual. So you have to be careful. Um, again, I, I respect all the research that's been done through the years. You have to. It's it's like, like I said, you stand on the shoulders of others, but um, there's more to it. And, and getting a good result is about making the face work. 